Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and if you're new, welcome to my channel. And I know last week's video was super short. It was, I think it was like 12 minutes. I know it was under 15. There wasn't too much information on it, so it was a little bit shorter. But today's video is gonna be a lot longer. I'm gonna start off the video with a disclaimer. I mean, no harm to anyone I talk about in the video and everything I found was online and is accessible to the public. And also a little graphic disclaimer for today's video. There's a lot of graphic content and not all of it is easy to handle so even I like when I was reading it like there's some parts I left out because I was like I don't even want to talk about that I don't want to put that online but if you want to know the gory details of it um, I'll leave my research down below like I'll leave the link so you can look into it if you don't feel comfortable with blood or cannibalism just don't watch the video or just skip through those parts so today's case is about an American serial killer who was from Sacramento and he was nicknamed the Sacramento Vampire. From that nickname, you can kind of tell why he was named that. Richard Chase was born May 23rd in 1950. He was raised in a really strict family and his dad was very abusive physically and mentally. So his father would often beat him physically. I don't know if they were divorced because later on in the story, like his father and mother, he lives with them separately. So I think they may have been divorced or they got a divorce. So as a young child, he showed signs of what was called the McDonald triad. So there's this theory by sociologists where a lot of serial killers show these three significant signs and they all have this in common. Though if you did this, it does not make you a serial killer, but majority of serial killers did have this trait growing up. But the trait was pretty much setting fires, animal cruelty, and wetting the bed. And it was actually a sociologist who came up with it and said that these were like the three significant signs that are present in majority of serial killers though obviously having that trait does not make you a serial killer so yeah, as an early teen and in his high school years he actually became an alcoholic he did have a few handful of relationships in high school but they never really worked out because he would never be able to get aroused by women and he wouldn't be able to hold a erection he learned that he would only get turned on by violent acts and stuff. So he did have a handful of relationships, but none of them worked out at the end. And he did show signs of mental health illnesses and he was clearly disturbed, but his father being the physically abusive person that he was, did not want to get him help and just didn't see that he needed the help. Or even if he did see it, he just refused to get him the help he needed. That's parental negligence. Chase's problems just kept continuing to grow. He was having more and more issues and to the point that his father had allegedly kicked him out of the house. And this is when he began to abuse drugs and alcohol more often than normal. And while he was on drugs, he would often believe that his heart had stopped and that he was pretty much a walking corpse. He also did fear for his health in that he believed that he lacked vitamin C. So then he would take whole oranges and put them against his forehead and he believed that it would help him absorb the nutrients instead of like eating it, he would just put it on his forehead. His brain would absorb the nutrients that it needed. So another strange um, delusion he had was that his cranial bone would break apart and move underneath the skin. And so eventually he shaved his head so that he could monitor the movements. So then in 1975, Chase attempted to inject himself with rabbit blood, believing that that would cure him, but that actually made him violently ill. And then he was institutionalized and he was also diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. So then he was placed into a mental asylum where he was being treated by various doctors. The nurses and the hospital workers would often find him outside with dead birds and he was attempting to drink their blood. The hospital staff nicknamed him Dracula. Like he would find dead birds and try to drink their blood because he believed that he was being poisoned. He believed that the bird's blood would prevent his blood from turning into powder. So there were other similar incidences that happened around the hospital. So for some reason, the hospital staff believed that he was rehabilitated and that he was doing better, even though he was clearly like picking up dead animals, trying to drink their blood still. 
But for some reason, the hospital staff thought he was fine and they sent him home to live with his mom. So he moved in with his mom, but there was no legal requirement that he had to live with his mom. So eventually he started to believe that his mom was poisoning him. So he moved out and he ended up moving into an apartment with a group of young boys he called his friends. And really quickly, these boys started to notice something weird about him, like Chase would start doing drugs again and he would walk around the apartment naked and just the boys felt uncomfortable. So they asked Chase to move out, but Chase refused to move out. He said he's not going to move out. So then the boys decided they'll just move out and they'll find a place of their own. So again, leaving Chase alone in an apartment by himself and completely alone. So then now that he's living alone, he has no one to watch over him or like take care of him. His symptoms started to get worse again and his fascination for blood started to resurface. And so this is when he began to capture small animals and he would kill them and he would eat them raw or he'd put their organs in a blender with soda and drink the mixture. That's nasty. One day in 1977, they didn't really say what date exactly, but in 1977, he went to his mom's house and he had a dead cat, kind of like showed her the dead cat and then he threw the dead cat on the ground and this is where it gets nasty. So if you don't want to hear it, just skip the next few minutes. So then he knelt down and he ripped open the cat's stomach with his bare hands and then he went on to put his hands inside the cat. He took the blood and he smeared it all over his face and his mother just calmly went back into the house and didn't report this to anybody. But I feel like again like that's negligence on her part for not calling the authorities and you know reinstitutionalizing him. So August 3rd of 1977, Nevada police saw Chase covered in blood in Lake Tahoe area. And side note, isn't Lake Tahoe in California? Like I know it's near Nevada, but isn't it in California? So isn't that out of their jurisdiction or whatever? But I don't know. And they see a liver in a bucket in his pickup truck. And so they question him and they see that the liver belonged to a cow and it was an animal liver and he said that the blood was his he cut himself or something but they didn't think anything of it they just questioned him and they walked away which i mean where did he get this cow liver from why does he have blood on him did he is the blood the cows but he said the blood was his so i don't know really strange that police overlooked this stuff and then it comes out that these guys are the ones that are doing this stuff so he continued to just fall in the cracks in the system so december 27th 1977 chase drove by a house and he fired his 22 caliber gun into someone's house and thankfully no one was injured, but the police were called. They did do their search. I don't think they were able to pin it on him or figure out that it was him. I'm guessing he did this because the report said that he was very frustrated and lonely and mad because his mom had told him not to come over for Christmas. So I believe it was December 29th, but 51 year old Ambrose Griffin was helping his wife bring in the groceries. And as he was doing that, Chase drove by. Using the 22 caliber gun, he shot Griffin in the chest. It immediately killed him. And so this was his first murder of a human. And this was what started his obsession. So a few days later, he attempted to enter into someone's house, but the door was locked, so he walked away. And later, like during his interrogation, he told police officers that if a house was locked, that meant that he was not invited in. But if a house was unlocked, it was an invitation in. So when the house was locked, he just walked away. So yeah, so as he was driving by, he met a girl named Nancy who actually attended the same high school as Chase. So she knew him and he offered to give her a ride. But at this point, physically, like his hygiene was really bad. The girl saw that and she saw the way he looked and just the way he presented himself. So she was really scared and 
she refused to take the ride which inevitably saved her life most likely he just kept driving and he stopped and he went to somebody's house and the house was unlocked and it was actually a married couple and no one was home at the time so he went in he stole a bunch of their valuables and he even urinated in their infant child's drawer like their clothing drawer and he did number two in their son's bed and unfortunately well fortunately i guess but the couple had actually returned home while chase was still inside their house and so the husband tried to fight off chase and chase did escape they didn't catch him or anything on january 23rd he entered the house of 22 year old Teresa wallen and Teresa was actually three months pregnant at the time and her front door was unlocked he entered the house so i believe at that time she was home alone yeah, so he entered the house and he shot Teresa with the same .22 caliber gun that he shot Griffin with and the same one he shot into the house that thankfully no one was injured in. He shot her three times killing her and then he stabbed her with a butcher's knife and then he removed her organs and drank her blood. And it was reported that he used a yogurt container as a cup and then just a few days after he had killed Teresa Wallen, he purchased two puppies from his neighbor. And as you can imagine what he did, he killed the puppies and he drank their blood and he took the dead bodies and threw them onto his neighbor's lawn. And I'm guessing it's the same neighbor that gave him the puppies. And I feel like at that point, like, wouldn't you report that? January 27th, 1978. So he entered the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Marat. And inside her house was her, obviously. And it was her 6-year-old son, Jason. And her 22-month-old nephew, David Ferreira. And a 51-year-old friend, Dan Meredith and he entered the house and he killed dan meredith in the hallway with the gun he shot him in the head and instantly killed meredith he took his keys his car keys and then he went upstairs and he found evelyn and her son jason in evelyn's room and then he proceeded to shoot six-year-old jason he did the same with Evelyn, but with Evelyn, he actually partly cannibalized her body. He cut her stomach open. She had a few missing organs and he attempted to remove one of her eyeballs and he sodomized her body before leaving. And it was said that a visitor had come to the house and that scared off Chase and he took 22 month old David with him when he left and he ran away in Dan's car. When the visitor had gone in and had seen what had happened, he alerted the neighbor and they called the authorities. And when the authorities did their search around the house, they saw Chase's footprint in Evelyn's blood. And they automatically like started their search, whatever. I don't know how they figured out that it was him. It didn't say in the report how they figured it out. They were able to identify his footprint in the blood and with david he actually decapitated him and david's body was found behind a church a couple months later police figured out it was chase and they arrested chase and when they did a search around his apartment they found utensils that were covered in blood and they also found human brains in the fridge it was enough evidence to arrest him so they arrested him and his trial began january 9th of 1979 and the trial lasted five months so chase's defense team rejected the suggestion for a death penalty on the grounds that chase is not guilty by reason of insanity but the jury felt otherwise and after deliberating for about five hours um, within two days they agreed with the prosecuting attorney and they recommended the death penalty so instead of life in prison he was given the death penalty so richard chase was found guilty for six counts of murder and he was given the death penalty by a gas chamber so chase was sent to san quentin state prison and he was supposed to stay there until his execution date however fellow inmates when they learned what he had done and his crimes they kept encouraging him to kill himself because they feared for their own safety so eventually chase 
would stockpile his anti-anxiety medication and when he had enough for a fatal overdose he ended up killing himself he was found dead in his cell the day after christmas in 1980. he was sentenced in may of 1979 and he was found dead in his cell the day after christmas in 1980. so that's the end of the story um just a few like personal comments and stuff about it about the death penalty like i agree with the death penalty with restriction like serial killers who clearly did it who there's clear evidence that they had done it I feel like they should be executed. I'm really 50-50 on that because sometimes I'm like, oh, like they should be put in a cell and by themselves, no TV, no nothing, you know, like the bare minimum and like they have to suffer for the rest of their life while everybody else, you know, gets to do them. But then at the same time, stuff like this, I'm kind of just like, if they're given the death penalty, like they should be executed within the week. Like, I don't think they should wait. I don't see a point in waiting. Maybe there's a reason they wait. I don't know. But also the system failed incredibly. The parents failed incredibly. Like, in this case, um, obviously you blame the killer himself. But you also feel like the parents should have done a better job to raise him. The negligence that they had towards him. His mother seeing him bring a dead cat to her and open him up and do what he did to that cat in front of her and she calmly like the report used the word calmly that's not me saying it but didn't report it to anyone i feel like that should have been reported the hospital saying that oh he's rehabilitated and he's fine he can live in society again when he was literally drinking bird blood because he thought that his blood was turning into powder like clearly he was having issues and the hospital failed him police who saw him drenched in blood with a cow's liver like that's not normal you know that's clearly signs of someone going through something regardless of what it is and obviously his parents like from a young age you see the signs of the mcdonald triad and you refuse to get your son help yeah he clearly has issues and you are going to ignore them i think everyone failed him i think he did not get the help that he needed and that led to a lot of issues and the death of six innocent people yeah so that's it that's the story of the sacramento vampire and this one was really disturbing i still left out some parts there were parts that pertain to how david had died if you're interested i'll leave it down below so if you want to look into that but other than that um that's the case it's a lot longer definitely longer than the last one definitely more sick than all the other ones i did so far i hope you guys enjoyed comment down below what you thought of the case what you found was the most interesting and if you have any other suggestions you can always leave them down below and don't forget to like and subscribe and i'll see you guys next time